Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Casual Audio Papers. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at this one, The Unintended Lessons in Brown v. Board of Education. And uh, the date that I am doing the search is in Google Scholar. Uh, August 24th, 2022, and I looked up Brown v. Board of, uh, Brown v. Board Bell. I was originally looking for Brown v. Board of Education and the Interest Convergence Dilemma, but that one is now behind a paywall. It was not at one point, but now it is. So I'm going to be reading this one because it lays out a lot of the same arguments that Brown v. Board of Education, that the one I was originally trying to look at lays out. So I'm going to click it. It is public access at this point. So here we go. The interesting thing about law papers is they don't have a um, an abstract. So you just kind of read it. OK. The Unintended Lessons in Brown v. Board of Education by Derek A. Bell, Jr. I want to talk about learning the lessons that the decision in Brown v. Board of Education could not teach. I note that the title of the symposium, Brown is Dead, Long Live Brown, places a question mark with, uh, with a period, or places a question mark after Brown is dead. I would like to replace the question mark with a period. The Brown decision, as far as the law is concerned, is truly dead and beyond resuscitation. The question is why on its 50th anniversary, Brown is not only remembered, but hailed as a landmark. Why, unlike thousands of other cases decided by the Supreme Court, its 50th anniversary is being celebrated and commemorated on, in the media and in dozens of conferences and symposiums. When was this? This was 2004, 2005. In 1970, courts finally began ordering enforceable school desegregation orders that went beyond the grade a year and freedom of choice plans that reflected a determination to retain segregated schools as long as possible. It was about that time that Yale Law School professor Alexander Bickel, a constitutional law scholar, predicted that over time Brown would lose its viability. He said, This is not to detract from the nobility of the Warren Court's aspiration in Brown, nor from the contribution to American life uh, of the rule that the state may not coerce or enforce the separation of the races. But it is to say that Brown v. Board of Education, with emphasis on the education part of the title, may be headed for, dread word, irrelevance. So basically, Derek Bell is saying so far that uh, the desegregation efforts based on um, American liberalism, uh, the individual liberal ideal, is not leading to um, desegregation because of freedom, essentially. At the time, we civil rights lawyers criticized Professor Bickle's prediction, but he proved more right than we were. Even today, many civil rights advocates, despite facts that are as hard, heartrending as they are in undeniable, maintain that Brown was and is a valuable precedent. They are entitled to their views, but they fit quite nicely with those who hold that the earth is, after all, flat. If we had only learned that the earth was not flat 50 years ago. There is a kind of solace in finding continuing meaning in Brown that avoids the hard-eyed conclusions that UCLA law professor Cheryl Harris reaches with regard to contemporary race jurisprudence. She starts from the assumption that Brown is irrelevant and asserts that, in at least two respects, current civil rights law approximates the jurisprudence of the era following Reconstruction when Plessy v. Ferguson was decided. So, you know, my particular interest is in the sciences, and it just goes to show that law is not a science. <laughs> you just assume something and then assert after the assumption something else. Okay, whatever. 
First, Professor Harris argues the Supreme Court seems to have adopted many of the specific forms of racial erasure that were prominent in the period of so-called Southern Redemption. Racial erasure is called upon and resuscitated in interpretations of the Equal Protection Clause that assigns the federal government a subordinate role relative to that of the states in protecting the right to be free from discrimination. That is, the federal government should be much more dominant and domineering, and the, the uh, states' rights should be removed or subverted when it comes to whatever Derek Bell is wanting. In support of her argument, Professor Harris cites the court's ruling in United States v. Morrison, striking down the section of the Violence Against Women Act that authorizes civil actions against perpetrators of gender-motivated violence. Hmm. Asserting both federalism and state sovereignty concerns, the Morrison Court found that the federal government lacked the power to enforce anti-discrimination laws against individuals as opposed to state actors. Which is true. I mean, there's no, like, federal police or anything. I guess you have federal courts, but, like, I don't know. Are you wanting people to go to federal prison for minor infractions? In doing so, the court ignored a luminous record of the state's failure to protect victims of sexual assault. The Morrison Court reached back to the civil rights cases in 1883, an 1883 decision invalidating, invalidating the first um, federal public accommodations law for its interpretation of the 14th Amendment. In so doing, the court embraced the same state's rights logic that constituted the bedrock of the segregationists' platform. Second, Professor Harris says that, like the Plessy Court in 1896, the current court insists that all racial identities are symmetrical and hold no special social significance. Indeed, under the guise of colorblindness, this court has naturalized and evacuating, evacuated race as a matter of law. The result is that the court now treats all race-conscious efforts to eradicate racial inequality as conceptually equivalent to acts designed to install racial hierarchy. And the reason is because they do. I mean, if you think one, if, if you have in your law the idea that one race is uh, in greater need than another, then you've necessarily assumed hierarchy. It's not like you have designed or put in place hierarchy. You assume there is a hierarchy and that uh, you need to fix it. Not only that, but like if you put in one law and then the landscape eventually changes, like let's say you assume that white people are higher in the hierarchy than black people, and then you say, well, we need to help black people. So you, inst you put in a law that helps black people. Eventually, if the black people ever um, rise above white people in the hierarchy, the law does not change. So there is a particular rigidity and, and uh, well, non-scientificness about this whole thing. Brown's demise is apparent even beyond an analysis of legal doctrine. A quick review of the current statistics on the resegregation of public schools shows that the implementation of Brown through the mechanisms of racial balance and busing was a failure. Despite hundreds of school desegregation suits, many lasting for decades, most Black and Latino students still attend public schools that are both racially separate and educationally ineffective. And there's one really good way to fix that, um, school choice. A study issued in 2003 by Gary Orfield's Pro-Integration Harvard Civil Rights Project reported that as of the 2000 to 2001 school year, white students, on average, attend schools, uh, attend schools where 80% of the student body is white. Many, if not most, predominantly black and Latino schools have substantially inferior resources to those provided to white schools in the same, in the same school system. Teachers are less experienced in the minority schools, students have more behavioral problems, and academic output is almost uniformly poor. That's actually not really true. 
I mean, I, I don't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but there have been, a, like, just an abundance of laws and and groups that have poured money into poorer neighborhoods and poorer schools, and it doesn't do anything. Um, when it comes to resources, this is a terrible metric for actual educational success, and it has less to do with the resources you pour into a particular school and much more to do with the uh, general school's culture. Like, are the teachers, do the teachers care about the students? That's one really important factor. And then um, are you cramming all the students into one place? Do you have smaller classrooms? Do you expect them to do well and have harsh penalties when they do not do well? And that sort of stuff. Those are all really important for uh, promoting success in schools. Now, the idea that the uh, uh, we, we were just talking about this, so it's pretty great. Um, the idea that um, let's see, the teachers are less experienced in the minority schools is probably um, a good, uh, not a good issue. It's uh, it's probably an actual issue with the schools. And that would be something that would be nice to fix. But I think, like, what are you going to do? Force teachers into certain schools or something? You wouldn't give the teachers their own choice on what schools they want to go to? School choice is really where it's at, man. That's, like, the best thing you could do. Turn the schools into a free market and then, well... You'll have people who want to go to the the McDonald's of schools, and then you'll have people who want to go to a better school. <clears throat> so you may ask, what can we learn from our 50 years of experience with the Brown, Brown decision? I think there are several lessons that are far more accessible now than they were when Brown was decided. Lesson one. Brown was not a revolutionary decision. Rather, it is the defin definitive example that the interest of blacks in achieving racial justice is accommodated only when and for so long as policymakers find that the interest of blacks converges with the political and economic interests of whites, which is a lie. That's just not true. Black people have been challenging segregation in the public schools since 1850, for the most part without success. As Professor Mary Dudziak has convincingly argued, the Brown decision advanced U.S. interests because racial segregation was hampering the United States in the Cold War with communist nations and undermining U.S. efforts to combat subversion at, subversion at home. Indeed, the NAACP brief in Brown argued that the separate but equal precedent of Plessy is not only unjust to blacks, but also bad for the country's image a barrier to the development in the South and harmful to its foreign policies. So, in other words, just because there were multiple interests in stopping segregation, like you had five different reasons to stop it, only the ones where it was self-serving actually count. Like, this person just said they had two things. First, it's unjust to blacks, which is which is, uh, what's it called? Altruistic. That's an altruistic reason. But also it's bad for the country's image. Meaning there are two reasons to desegregate. An altruistic reason and a self-serving reason. Should we only do altruistic things and not serve ourselves at all? Should we, should we actually hamper our own economic success? in the United States in order to do some sort of supposedly just thing? The interest convergence uh, theory is, well, it's a strange metric for determining whether or not something was just. Just because I, like, like just because I'm selling you something and I'm making money doing it, and you get something in return. So both of us did something, we both got something that we wanted, and therefore I'm evil for selling you something for some sort of profit. 
it's just some weird Marxist stuff. So, in other words, it's a barrier to um, the development in the South and harmful to its foreign policy. Because, yeah, segregation is a barrier to the development in the South. This wasn't just argued by the Southerners. This was argued by, like, Frederick Douglass. He, when he escaped the South, he went up to the North and said, wow, the, the economy up here is doing great. You don't need slaves in order to thrive as a state. In fact, it might even be something that's hampering you. That's not an argument saying that the Southerners were bad for releasing their slaves. Well, the ones that did it willingly, if, if any of them did. If any of them did it willingly because they thought it would be better for their bottom line, it's not bad. Slaves were freed. It's just silly. The amicus briefs filed by the Justice Department were the ones that really hammered away at how important it was that the court strike down public school segregation. The, uh, to emphasize this point, the government included a lengthy quote from the Secretary of State, Dean Ackeson, in its brief. Quote, During the past six years, the damage to our foreign relations attributable to race discrimination has become progressively greater. The United States is under constant attack in the foreign press, over the foreign radio, and in, and in such international bodies as the United Nations because of various practices of discrimination against minority groups in the country, end quote. It'd be equivalent to me saying when Barack, Barack Obama said that certain people are going to be on the wrong side of history or whatever, that he is only worried about, let's say, gay marriage because of interest convergence. He doesn't want to be on the wrong side of history, so therefore the only reason he cares about gay marriage, or let's say Joe Biden, or Donald Trump, or whoever cares about gay marriage, the only reason is because it, it'll be bad for their image in the future. It's a silly argument. It really is. Atkinson argued that, quote, the undeniable existence of racial discrimination gives unfriendly governments the most effective kind of ammunition for the propaganda warfare, end quote, and that school segregation has been, quote, singled out for hostile foreign comment in the United Nations and elsewhere, end quote. He concluded that racial discrimination in the United States remains a source of constant embarrassment to, the gov to this government in the day-to-day -day conduct of its foreign relations, and it jeopardizes the effective maintenance of our moral leadership of the free and democratic nations of the world, end quote. While there is no record that foreign policy was debated by the Brown justices in conference, Professor Dudziak has found speeches by both Justice Warren and Justice Douglas bewailing segregation's adverse effects on U.S. foreign policy. Surely, Justice Frankfurter and the other members of the court were, were able to draw a connection between the foreign policy difficulties described by Secretary of State Atkinson. The fears of, sub, of subversion at home that were exploited during the Joseph McCarthy era and the barriers to black freedom and equality that were widely trumpeted abroad during the war. So in other words, there's no proof that this is why they did it, but we know this was on their mind. The issue is, if if there was any evidence that this was why they were doing it, or the only reason why they were doing it, what about what about the objecting opinion? What did they say? Did they say anything about this? So you're just making it up. Well, it is law theory and not scientific theory. Brown is the definitive, but far from the only, example of interest convergence at work. The 19th century equivalent of Brown was the Emancipation Proclamation. President Lincoln's priority was saving the Union, not freeing the slaves. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation when he recognized that it would improve the Union's chances in the Civil War by disrupting the Confederate workforce and discouraging European nations, particularly England and France, from siding with the Confederacy. After Lincoln turned the Civil War into a war to free the slaves, as well as to save the Union, European abolitionists made certain 
that their governments did not enter the war on the side of the Confederacy. The Emancipation Proclamation also opened the way for the Union to enlist thousands of former slaves who made the difference in many battles, although with very heavy casualties. That's also just not true. This is another thing. Interest convergence is a, is a really great thing. The fact that we don't try to do interest convergence now... Actually, no, no, we do. Actually, we do. Um, anytime a corporation puts anything out that has anything to do with politics, they don't care about politics. They want to look good. That's interest convergence. Are you going to decry Disney for allowing gay people on their, on their um, higher levels or as CEOs or whatever just because they want to look good? It, again, it's a silly argument. Plus, like, th it's the only way to get people to go along with you. Otherwise, you're telling people to do something that's that they have no way of knowing whether or not they'll benefit. And the the proportion of people who are willing to just do it out of some sort of altruistic uh, cause is not is not a critical mass to get anything done. And so interest convergence is a necessary component of any policy. So when you're talking about Abraham Lincoln, the supposed idea is that Abraham Lincoln actually didn't want to free the slaves, but it made him look good to the world stage. And I've heard this from other people who I've talked to and everything, but when you, when you read Abraham Lincoln's journal, you know, the stuff that he wrote for himself, um, it's very clear he saw slavery as an inherent injustice, and he really did want to free the slaves. But... He couldn't have been elected president the first time around on that platform because not only did all of the southern states, or not only would they have not voted for him, but there are many um, northern states that also would not vote for him because it was a radical position. The abolitionist position, it was like, let's see, what would be a modern equivalent? I don't know what a modern equivalent would be, but it was a it was a radical position, and um, you just wouldn't win anything, like any political office from that position, unless you're in some very specific uh, um, area with a very specific office. But the big thing is he really did want to free the slaves. He, he wrote about it in, in his journal. Not only that, but you have plenty of people from around that time period, from the uh, founding of the United States, from before the United States were founded, that um, really wanted to free the slaves. John Wesley was one. Um, John Woolman was another one. And then you had plenty of others. Uh, these people had it in their soul that they wanted to free the slaves and and to say that all of that is meaningless just because it happened to oh well just because all of the rest of the white world wouldn't be uh, wouldn't go along with you or wouldn't side with you in a war unless you did it that's also another really strange argument like to say that france and britain would have sided with the South just because, or no, no, to say that Abraham Lincoln wanted to free the slaves just so that all of the rest of the white world, the European world, would not side with him if they didn't, That's that sort of argument is shooting yourself in the foot when, if you want to get your point across, it's saying that Abraham Lincoln was bad for such and such a reason, but the main point that I'm trying to get across that uh, whatever this critical race theory is being that Europeans in general have um, made this their policy and um, put people of color underneath their knee or whatever, then, then all the other Europeans wanted to free the slaves. 
it's a silly argument. It's um, historically illiterate, and uh, the main point is it's a legal theory. It's not really a scientific theory. A century later, political and business leaders lobbied for the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. They recognized that televised images of Southern police forces violently attacking sit-in protesters and marchers had generated widespread support for these measures. According to University of Virginia law professor Michael Klarman, their support for civil rights legislation, after decades of ignoring the injustice of racial segregation, was inevitable because of a variety of deep-seated social, political, and economic forces that would have undermined racial segregation whether or not the Supreme Court had intervened in Brown. Professor Klarman acknowledged that while Brown acted as a catalyst for the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, it did not do so for the reasons commonly cited. It'd be, I'd be interested to see what he's saying. But the main point with Brown is that it, it made it not only just the law of the land, but it, but it made it one of the foundational laws of the land. Lesson 2. Interest convergence is far more important to gaining relief from racial injustice than the degree of harm suffered by blacks or the character of proof offered to, to demonstrate racial harm. The efforts for, um, over many years to get Congress to enact anti-lynching laws is an excellent e example. Such legislation was never enacted despite the thousands of black people killed in horrible ways over several decades. That's probably because it wasn't primarily a, a black issue. Like, the, so the, the Southerners lynched a lot of people, <laughs> including black people, and it was probably disproportionately black, but those guys were rough. Also, Congress was most likely filled with Southerners, a large proportion of Southerners, and if you wanted to get anything done, you, you needed to have them on your side. Again, this interest convergence is actually really important in terms of any sort of justice moving forward. It is just as easy to find contemporary examples of racial injustices about which society is aware, but is manifestly uninterested in rem uh, remedying. There is the refusal of Congress or the executive branch to alter the federal sentencing guidelines that have resulted in large disparities in the sentences handed out to blacks and Spanish-speaking people compared to whites who are convicted in drug cases. Another example is a recent study that shows that almost one half of black men from ages 16 to 64 in New York City are unemployed, with roughly 35% of these men out of the job market and no longer looking for employment. Massive unemployment is certainly a factor in the large percentage of black men in prison for nonviolent drug offenses. There is, however, virtually no public outrage about these statistics. At least, there is no outrage compared to the crisis that would be proclaimed if conditions in mostly white suburbs were, generated, were generating similar statistics. I really don't think, I mean, that's just sort of making stuff up again. Like, this is the issue with a lot of this um, critical race theory and legal theory stuff is they just, like, make stuff up. It's like, there's no outrage about this thing, but there would be if it were white. There's, what's the evidence of this? Because, honestly, white people don't care about white people all that much. We don't care about each other. <laughs> Lesson three. Even when interest convergence results in a potentially effective racial remedy, that remedy will be abrogated as soon as it threatens the superior societal status of whites, particularly those in the middle and upper classes. For example, when Southerners responded to the first Brown decision in 1954 with massive resistance, neither Congress nor the White House showed any interest taking the political risk of upholding the law of the land. With no support from the other branches of government forthcoming, the court issued its second Brown decision in 1955 that withdrew its earlier commitment to desegregation by setting a standard for compliance, the all-deliberate-speed standard, that was so vague that it all but halted the implementation of the first Brown decision for at least 15 years. Right, because 
true justice is forcing an entire people group to change their laws. Now, in this case, it might have been, but in the vast majority of cases, it's not. And the issue with this is that, especially at the time, um, you don't know exactly. And so a lot of times, and he's saying that something like it's abrogated. It was abrogated to say, we need to do this. There's outrage. Okay, we listen to you. We need to do this eventually. Now, I do know that that would be somewhat frustrating if you were a black person living in the South, but you can't, you can't imagine, or you can't just fabricate the idea that each step in the right direction is evil just because it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. Today, all the laws are gone because of that first step. Any law that would segregate, well, any law that would, that is, um, that, that, that would have been put in force by any sort of conservative government that separates the races is gone. But laws that separate the races put in by a liberal government would be perfectly fine, like like they were trying to do in California here a few years ago. You would never know it from the, oppos the opposition and determined resistance of so many whites, but the Brown decision was actually a good, a good deal for white Americans. Professor Louis Michael Seidman explains how Brown brought about a transformation without real change. As he views it, the Brown court faced a massive contradiction between the nation's oft-cited commitment to equality and the great values that whites placed on the racial preferences and pri uh, priorities that were tacitly approved in Plessy. Given black Americans' lack of political and economic power, it appears that their demand for equality would never be satisfied for both foreign and domestic policy reasons. However, some time, something needed to be done. So desegregation helped white people a lot, even though white people were mad about it. So now this is another example of an argument shooting itself in the foot because you are basically saying it was good, but also bad. I am focusing on the bad portion of it, but I also want to focus on the good portion of it because a good portion was also bad. It's uh, a circular and absurd argument in general. Let me uh, phrase that a little more clearly. The proposition is that the court did this and white people in general, like America at large, did this because they knew that doing this would be good for them. That is the uh, interest convergence idea. Proposition two is white people at large did not know that this was going to be good for them. Conclusion is it was both good and but they knew that it was good for them. They did this because it was good for them. And also they didn't know that this was good for them. See, it doesn't make any sense, but I guess if you're a critical race theorist, sent, sense doesn't really mean anything. As Professor Seidman puts it, the contradictions in the, the ideology of the separate but equal doctrine were permanently destabilizing, and threatened any equilibrium, end quote. By purporting to resolve those contradictions, Brown served to end their destabilizing potential. The court, Seidman claims, quote, resolved the contradictions by definitional fiat. Separate facilities were now simply proclaimed to be inherently unequal. But the flip side of this aphorism was that once white society was willing to make facilities legally non-separate, the demand for equality had been satisfied and blacks no longer had just cause for complaint. The mere existence of Brown thus served to legitimate current arrangements. 
True, many blacks remained poor and disempowered, but their status was now no longer a result of the denial of equality. Instead, instead it marked a personal failure to take advantage of one's definitionally equal status. Which is true. Brown v. Board was not enough. That's why it's a step in the right direction. That laid the groundwork for the Civil Rights Act, because if Brown v. Board said that it is against the Constitution to, to have unequal and, or to have equal but separate facilities, or integration was necessary, then the Civil Rights Act made it law, made it more clear. So I don't know what the issue is. Like, Brown v. Board is irrelevant because it was one of the foundational building blocks for both the Civil Rights Act and then our current... Um, Weltanschauung, Weltanschauung, it, it laid the groundwork, for, uh, that was the wrong German word I was thinking, Zeitgeist is the one I was thinking of. But Brown laid the groundwork. It was one of the steps in the right direction towards our current zeitgeist that all races need to be equal. Therefore, it's wrong. Because it wasn't, it didn't articulate perfectly our current zeitgeist. It's just silly. It's entirely silly. The Brown decision's rejection of the racial barriers imposed by segregation um, then reinforced the fiction that the path of progress was clear. Everyone could and should succeed through individual ability and effort. One would think that this reinforcement of the political and economic status quo would have placated, if not pleased, even the strongest supporters of segregation. After all, blacks did not demand, nor did the court offer, any damages or reparations for the harm and loss caused by decades of segregation. See, it one thing the bell does not realize is this the people who wanted segregation the people who wanted racism did not want brown, brown v board of education it was not seen as an interest convergence with their interests they didn't like it and he is admitting this in this paragraph right here they they didn't like this this Supreme Court decision. Because he doesn't understand what he's talking about. Rather than accept a good deal, however, white pol politicians used the Brown decision to enrage large groups of white people. Initially in the South, but also in the North, as efforts to implement the decision moved across the country. In effect, whites demanded this, the name segregation as well as the game of white racial preference. Demanded the name segregation as well as the game of white racial preference because white people don't like each other. We're not one monolithic group. The people in the South in those days did not want segregation. Like they wanted white racial preference. The ones in uh, that 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 decided Brown v. Board of Education and that entire group of white people that decided that that was good did not want white racial preference or whatever. This is some sort of conspiracy theory that, that Bell and a lot of people like him uh, decide to believe in because, well, it's good for them. Initially, the federal courts responded cautiously to white resistance in an effort to allow time for the process of desegregation to work, like any reasonable court would. But over time, the courts issued a series of stronger and more specific orders that were intended to assert their judicial authority as much as to carry out the mandate of Brown. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's what that's what happened. White people decided that white people in the South that liked segregation decided that they were just going to not follow the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court got all butthurt and was like, you are subverting my authority. I must... Now, now I'm offended. It's not about the justice of this issue. It's because of my own ego. 
These orders were implemented eventually, but white parents' fear of sending their children to desegregated schools drove many of them either to move to mainly white school districts or to enroll their children in all-white private schools. The primary reason for racial balance remedies departed right along with those white families. Yeah, yeah, because um, you can't control everybody. Again, that this is the issue is you need to change the culture. And, and although that most likely happened throughout the country, inevitably desegregation and integration are, are the only just ways to go forward in creating equality. There's no other just way of doing it. It is interesting, although far from encouraging, to compare white opposition to the Brown decision with the violent reaction of whites who opposed the Emancipation Proclamation. Ignorant or uncaring of the fact that Lincoln's action would greatly benefit the Union, whites rioted in New York City and elsewhere after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, killing innocent black people and destroying property. In the mid... which is exactly what I said. President Lincoln could not run on... Um, abolition. Although he was an abolitionist, he could not run on abolition or say it publicly because even many people in the, in the North did not like that. In the midterm elections, many whites voted against the Republicans. After the Union Army won the Civil War with substantial help from freed blacks, however, opposition by Southern whites and disinterest by Northern whites uh, led to the abandonment of Reconstruction policies. These actions un undermined the political and economic gains blacks were making, and opened the way to massive violence against any blacks deemed not to know their place. This history-wide pattern of white resistance to policies that normally address racial injustices, but are substan substantively more valuable to whites and the nation can be observed today in widespread white opposition to affirmative action policies. Those policies are directly and indirectly more valuable to whites and to the country's well-being than they are to blacks. Just to prove that one, but... I don't, I don't see his point here. He's saying that People who oppose affirmative action are the same people who opposed freeing the slaves. Anyway, it's a silly argument. One of the characters in the old radio series, The Shadow, was a superhero who could become invisible because he had the power to cloud men's minds. Racism has a similar power to cloud American minds. Racism prevents many whites from understanding that they are the majority beneficiaries of civil rights policies, and many blacks rely on and defend those policies with little appreciation for what motivated their issuance and how vulnerable they are to withdrawal when conditions change. I really don't understand the argument. He's saying that white people primarily want to benefit white people. Therefore, they're bad? Well, again, white people don't really like white people all that much. But the issue with that is, okay, so suppose he's right. White people primarily want to benefit white people. If you truly believe that, are you going to try to subvert that? If white people are the ones in majority power and they primarily want to benefit themselves, and they want to keep black people down. And then you say, you are bad for doing that. And Derek Bell, I believe, is a black person. Um, what are white people going to say? So? They're going to say so. We're not, they would say, we're not bad. We are simply doing what benefits us. We're doing the group equivalent of look out for number one. 
speaking morally, because legal theory is inevitably an ethical theory, uh, there's nothing wrong whatsoever with looking out for your own interests. Because who says otherwise? Altruism is only good insofar as you are you have the resources to do it. Altruism, if it if you don't have the resources to be altruistic, then it, it's a net detriment, not only because you uh, may perhaps lift somebody else up, but inevitably you don't lift them up to the same degree that that would allow them to be self-sufficient. Because if, well, you don't have the resources to sustain yourself, how are you going to give someone else the resources to sustain themselves? But not only that, it also destroys you. And so if you're, let's say, speaking from a utilitarian perspective, that is necessarily a net detriment. If you have enough resources to sustain yourself or your family, and then you give half of that to somebody else, you both have only half of the resources required to sustain yourself. So you both die. Now, from a utilitarian standpoint, instead of one person dying, two people die. Now, if you're looking at it from a deontological standpoint, um, you have to prove that altruism is good for, in the first place. You can't just assert that altruism is good. You have to prove it. And if you don't believe in any sort of objective morality, then it's your word against mine, ultimately. And if the if the group in power has has all the say, like if there's a group in power and a group not in power, and it's one one group's word against the other group, then the group in power is just the most logical and rational thing to do is to just sustain its own power. You have to, first of all, believe that there's some sort of authority behind the uh, the principles that you are promoting. And if you believe that, let's say, um, r uh, racism is wrong, what's the authority behind that claim? Well, if the authority is that all men are created equal, now you're going back to a document written by white people. Who came up with that theory? White people. Okay, so you're believing white people who you are trying to demonize wrote the good theory that you're trying to uphold. See, this whole issue with looking at gr uh, people in terms of groups and not in terms of individuals with their own little um, idiosyncrasies and their uh, issues with the culture that they grew up in. The issue with that is it's nonsensical. Now, from my perspective as a uh, messianic, my primary moral framework stems from the Bible. And so if my ethical theory stems from the Bible, then uh, we can say truly that all men are created equal. <clears throat> The issue here is that the Bible also has books of wisdom that say that we do need to look out for ourselves. And so Derek Bell is just sort of entirely ethically nonsensical. Or I should rephrase that. The ethic found in the Bible is that you cannot destroy yourself in order to uh, uplift somebody else, not in any real sense. You are supposed to humble yourself. But doing... No, let me rephrase that, because actually the Bible does talk about that to, to some degree, at least in terms of brothers. The ethic is there's no um, there's no slave or free, there's no male or female, there's no Greek or Jew. That is, all people are one in Christ. However, it, it does kind of support segregation against non-believers and believers. So there's still an in-group and an out-group that you have to deal with. 
and that's uh, found in 2 Corinthians 6, I believe. I'm going to shelve that for a little bit. Basic idea. Derek Bell, his, whatever his ethical theory is, doesn't have any authority behind it. And because these ethical theories, that the ones that he is putting forward, is just from any reasonable standpoint nonsensical, like interest convergence is a very important thing in terms of a polity, then you have to move away from that ethic and you have to come to a more rational ethic. And I think in terms of like, if you're comparing the critical race theory ethic to let's say the biblical ethic, the sort of foundational principles that one, um, you need to make steps in the right direction. That's uh, in terms of the biblical ethic. Steps in the right direction or this process of sanctification is really important. You don't denigrate the steps just because it's not absolute perfection. Nobody's going to be absolutely perfect. And so if you uh, take a system and demonize it because it's not perfect, then that's not, it's just not going to work because no, no system and no person is perfect. And so if you demonize a person because they're not perfect and you don't demonize yourself, then you are, well, blind. Racism has clouded your minds. So there's that first. Brown v. Board of Education was one such step. And another part of the ethical theory found within uh, the Bible is that hierarchy exists and it's a good thing. You have priests, you have kings, you have princes, you have governors, you have uh, people groups that are allowed into Jerusalem to worship God and people, people groups that are not until they become part of the people group that is. Now, racial hierarchies are absolutely, they are absolutely removed from the Bible entirely. They're foreign to the Bible. That's true. And I think one of the issues with Derek Bell's um, mindset is he is looking at this entirely in terms of racial hierarchies. And I think when you have a biblical framework, what you do is you look at it in terms of ideological hierarchies. You have, of course, the biblical faith, which would be at the top of the hierarchy, and then everybody um, falls below it. But what that means is you have to look at every Christian as essentially equal, every Messianic, every Jew. They are all equally part of God's kingdom. Now, even within that, there's hierarchy because hierarchy is inherently a good that can be uh, turned into an evil. But to say that there's, let's say, the critical race theory ethic is that inequity equals something bad, to say that is to ignore reality and to ignore true ethics. And then you have, okay, so equity, racism, and uh, power. I guess power would necessarily be within the inequity. So political power, to, uh, people actually need to have political uh, different levels of political power, not in terms of race, but in terms of some other, uh, some ideological or some religious framework. To say that you need to sort of reverse those hierarchies of racial power by just doing the opposite, having a hierarchy of racial power in the opposite direction, is wrong, according to the true biblical ethic. Instead, you want to remove all racial hierarchies. And that is the true, true biblical ethic. But unfortunately, what Derek Bell is advocating against is the removal of all racial hierarchies. He's saying that the whole idea of color blindness is wrong. It's not just something that 
is an ideal that might not ever be attained. That's not what he's arguing. He's saying that the idea of, col of colorblindness is wrong, as many critical race theorists believe and argue for. Well, colorblindness is correct. It is the ideal. And at least from a biblical standpoint, that's the case. And any theory, any ethical theory that would go against that has to prove that it has at least equal authority as the Bible has. And in order to prove that, they have to, ha they have to say that their God is equal or greater than the biblical God. And then in order to say that, they have to prove it. Lesson four. I should probably end it there. I'll continue. Oh, this, this is the last lesson. I'll finish it. That's just a long lesson. Lesson four. The Brown decision encouraged post-World War II challenges to segregation in public transportation and facilities. Of course, as Michael Seidman and others have suggested, there were multiple forces that combined to undermine the most stark aspects of racial segregation after World War II. These po positive developments should not, however, prevent us from acknowledging that Brown was a disaster for the schooling of black children. Yeah. Never let any optimism get in the way of your pessimism. In W.E.D. Du Bois, uh, Dr. W.D.E. Du Bois accurately predicted that the South would not comply with the Brown decision for, for many years, long enough to ruin the education of millions of black and white children. I, would not, uh, I was not aware of Dr. Du Bois' war warning in the early 1960s when I was litigating school desegregation suits at the NAACP LDF, and had I known about it, I would not have accepted it. Oh, really, would you? At that time, I believed that my work on school desegregation might prove to be the high point of my career. I was wrong. <laughs> the implementation of the court orders that I helped obtain result um, that I helped obtain resulted in the closing of black schools and the dismissal of thousands of black teachers and administrators. Now, yeah, that that is a really bad thing to do. What what was he doing? How do you desegregate schools by closing them down? When the black children who were the beneficiaries of those court orders were admitted previously to all white schools, they often faced hostility and only infrequently found a teaching environment that was conducive to their needs. Right, because a little bit of good being better than no good is not good and it is not as good as perfect and that's the issue desegregated schools adopted tracking mechanisms that placed most blacks on non-academic tracks black children were disproportionately disciplined and there was little consideration given to black cultural interests moreover despite the priority given to white students their parents either refused to enroll them in desegregated schools or removed them from those schools as soon as they were able Alas, there is no reason to speak of these educational outrages in the past tense. These policies are still followed in all too many per, uh, supposedly desegregated schools. The issue here, again, is really, you, if you have a, a parent like this, who believes that all black people are evil or whatever, thinks that they'll infect their child, and you have a child who knows black people, well, and they know that what their parents say about the black people that they know are is wrong. Who cares what the parents say? Like, I mean, yeah, it's bad what they're saying and everything, and it's bad what they do. But if uh, if a child is proximal, has proximity to a variety of black people, and maybe they're friends with one or two. They know that, quote, not all black people are bad or whatever. Then they know that their parents' ideology is either wrong or it will slowly be chipped away in that child's mind. 
and then they'll be more comfortable with having black people in their schools. The issue, again, is desegregation isn't a one-generation thing. It's like a four- to six-generation thing. And so you want, like, the perfect level of desegregation on the first generation. It's just not going to happen, not unless you enslave everybody. For these and several other reasons that I have suggested, a Brown decision that mandated the full enforcement of the equal uh, portion of the separate but equal doctrine, rather than one striking that doctrine down, might have better advanced the education of black as well as white children. Such a result would have appeared to be a devastating defeat to the civil rights lawyers who had persisted in their struggle against segregation for over 20 years, but it would have led to a better outcome in the long run. So, again, he's just making stuff up. It's like, it, this is, there's a name for this. It's called um, alternative history or something like that, where you just, like, run something in a little simulation in your mind. Like, what would have happened if if Hitler was a woman or something like that? You run the simulation in your mind and you make stuff up. You make some sort of narrative or story up uh, to make it seem plausible. And so he's like, what would have been a better more perfect situation do this maybe possibly but how does he know first of all and second of all he would have found a way to complain about the results of that too why you might ask try to remake history a half century after the fact well he's answering my question i guess i do so with far more pain than pleasure I do so in order to demystify court-ordered racial remedies, and in fact, all racial justice policies that promise far more in relief than they can deliver. Well, if Brown v. Board promised that all races are going to be getting along perfectly and seeing Kumbaya right after the decision, then yeah, they were wrong. But I don't think that was the promise or the expectation. Racism is still the glue that holds our society together. That's not true. Despite its tremendous disparities in wealth, income, and opportunity. What? Yeah, racism is not the glue that holds our society together. And an opinion like that is just... I mean, it makes sense why he complains about everything. Brown gets undeserved credit for desegregating public facilities other than schools. That, that process was encouraged by Brown, but it was not the decisive factor. In fact, prior to Brown, some southern states were already working to equalize black schools, admittedly in hopes of avoiding a desegregation order. The process of setting requirements and standards for the equalization of public schools was already underway when, when Brown was decided. The addition of integrated monitoring teams and a requirement of black community representation on school boards would likely have enhanced the efforts of the black teachers and administrators who had labored for decades in inadequate facilities, but with some success. Without Brown, perhaps, politicians would not have been able to rally white support for the massive resistance campaign that turned the South into a closed society for more than a decade. In order to gain and remain in office, even moderate politicians like Alabama Governor George Wallace and Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus became all-out segregationists. Wait, wait, wait. So is his argument that Brown v. Board should have been slower in their approach? Less radical? Maybe that would not have happened if the court had recognized, as some of the beliefs submitted by Brown argued, that black kids were not the only ones hurt by segregation. Indeed, white kids were harmed as well, both in the quality of their schools, even though they were far superior to the facilities provided for blacks, and also because segregation instilled in them the sense that they were superior. I don't know. I think I'm... How, like, who thinks this is good? Who thinks this 
is good scholarship. This is terrible scholarship. You just make stuff up. You say one thing and then the opposite of that thing as if both of them were true. Like, what? who's listening to this? Who's reading this and like saying, wow, that's so true. It makes no sense at all. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to continue reading this. It's just really, really bad. I don't know. I don't have it in me. I'll read the last paragraph because maybe he summarizes everything. Uh, last two paragraphs. Professor Robert Gordon of Stanford University offers encouragement in this likely lifelong process when he reminds us that things seem to change in history when people break out of their accustomed ways of responding to domination by acting as if the constraints on them are not real and they have the power to change things. Sometimes they can change things, although not always in the ways they had hoped or intended, but they cannot know whether they have the power to change things until they try. Preston Wilcox, the longtime Harlem activist, restates Gordon's words in the form of a grassroots challenge. Nobody can free us but ourselves. His, ad his admonition has meaning for every aspect of life for African Americans and all those deemed outsiders. Nowhere does it have greater relevance than the education of our children. Preston Wilcox's truth is easier to acknowledge than to act on, but this, of course, is usually both the measure and the challenge of truth. The issue with that last sentence is basically saying that black people or other like types of people can't succeed in general, but it's just not true. Some of the most successful people are first generation immigrants where like my grandma is one. She was a first generation immigrant from uh, Peru. And what she did was she worked really hard, like, became a millionaire, then had a bad investment and lost it all. And she worked really hard again, became a millionaire. She, she was like a real estate investor or something like that, then made a bad investment and lost it all. And now she's working really hard again and becoming a millionaire again. I mean, in America, if you work really hard, you'll probably do fine. I mean, in all, in all honesty, um, there are some people, a very small number of people who work really hard and do things right and it doesn't work out fine for them, and that's a tragedy. But in America, if if things are not working out for you, the first question you should ask is not, what has the system done to me? But more, what am I doing wrong here? Like, I personally was homeless, like, for most of my life. And, I mean... Now I'm going to like an Ivy League school paid for by myself because I, first of all, worked really hard, um, had to learn a bunch of different financial habits that uh, were fr frankly destroying me uh, before, but now I've adjusted many of them, uh, um, went to school, got my educational stuff situated, started a business, and I'm not doing perfectly. I'm not, I'm not doing fabulously, but I'm doing good. And that's true for anybody who tries. You just, you got to really try. Now, for me, it was like a five to seven year process, or even more than that. It started when I was like 18. Um, well, and then I got my first apartment when I was... I guess 23. Yeah, I know. So five, a five year process. I guess, no, I'm, I'm still really learning about, I'm still learning my lessons. So even now it's, it's closer to a 10 year process. Yeah. It's one of those things where you got to work really hard for 10 years before like you really start getting on your feet. If you are in the worst position that you can be in, if you're homeless, if you have no opportunities available for you, 10 years, a good decade of hard work, and 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 you'll start to see major improvement. It's not going to be easy. 
it's never easy. But the great thing is if your parents weren't rich, you can at least be middle class and help your children to be far beyond that to make to get far beyond wherever you get. And that's the great thing about America. That's the great thing about the free market. That's a great thing about school choice. It's the great thing about the, our culture. And people like Derek Bell want to destroy that in favor of some perfect world where everybody gets, I don't know, all the cake that they want to eat and they all look beautiful and they're all healthy and they, they all are, I don't know, have their own little matrix where everything that they ever wanted is presented to them on a silver platter. It's just not true. It's not the reality. Blood, sweat, and tears. That's how you make it in America. Whether you start out wealthy or whether you get there or whether your children get there. That's how you make it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably do some more of this. It's just so bad. The scholarship is horrible. It's, you, you just, you make stuff up. It's all made up and then people quote it. I don't know. It, it's bad. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I know that my little rant about biblical ethics is uh, a little weak and I'll definitely have to look, uh, think more about that sort of stuff. Um, I think what I was trying to say is there's this verse that says a person who does not provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. And what that means is you can't destroy yourself and your family in order to provide for someone else because that's worse than just not providing for them. That's the biblical ethic. And if you want one family or one group of people to completely destroy themselves in, in, uh, for the sake of another group, then what you're doing is harmful and evil. And unless you can come up with a better ethic, with a better authoritative foundation, then that's just a fact. So if you have any questions, uh, if you actually found this paper worthwhile, let me know. Have a good day.